Amen. But 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the title of the message this morning is The Married and Unmarried. The Married and Unmarried. This topic covers, I mean, you, you were listening to it, it covers marriage, it covers divorce, it covers being single, it's, it covers um, widows, you know, it covers all kind of a range of things, you know. So I can't really focus on just the one topic. I've got to cover it all in this chapter. I'll do the best I can. But look at verse number one. Let's start with verse number one. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now what, what is that saying? Is that saying that it's bad or it's evil, it's sinful for a man to touch a woman? No. The context that is given right now is that of a single person. Someone that is single, someone that's a virgin, someone that's unmarried, it's good for that man not to touch the woman, okay? This chapter, you'll see, is an encouragement toward those that are single. It's an encouragement to those that are unmarried, okay? Because so many times people feel, especially in our society, and in, in certain churches as well, they feel pressured to get married. You know, that they're getting, it, they're getting on in the years, they've not found the right partner, they've not found a, a godly spouse. You know, and people say, well, you know, when are you going to get married? That pressure that gets put upon, upon single people, you know? And look, obviously there are some people that avoid getting married, what's, you know, altogether. You know, I'm, I'm not talking about them, I'm talking about people that are genuinely trying to find a spouse, genuinely trying to get married, but they feel the pressure. And you'll, you'll notice this chapter, Paul is really encouraging those that are single. So it is a good thing to remain unmarried. It is a good thing not to touch a woman, meaning not to commit fornication with that woman if you're unmarried, okay? You'll see the context of that a little bit later. Verse number, well, let's look at verse number two. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication... Okay, so does that make sense? It's good not to touch a woman. It's good not to commit a fornication, right? So, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Okay, so it's good to remain single, but nevertheless, if you, you know, to, to, provo to avoid fornication, it's best that you do get married. It's best that you do find a husband or a wife, okay? Those are the kind of things. It's not a, a, a bad thing to be married. It's not a bad thing to remain single. Both are good. Okay? And especially if you're struggling with the sin of fornication, the best way to overcome that is to get married. Okay? Or you know, if, if you're someone that feels, I can't contain, get married. Okay? Find a godly spouse and get married because at that stage you can, you can enjoy that part of the marital physical relationship without committing fornication, without being in sin, for it to be a beautiful and natural thing that uh, looks after, that, sorry, that cherishes that marriage. It's an important part of your marriage. Now, there are those that teach, you know, some churches that teach verse number one, saying, see, it, it's like, you know, church leaders shouldn't get married, okay? Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Keep a finger in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, but please turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Because right now I'm thinking of the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, who requires their priests, requires their cardinals and their bishops and their pope to be celibate, okay, to, to remain unmarried, okay? Now, is that what Paul is saying? Is Paul saying that church leaders ought to be unmarried, okay? Now, look at, look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So what are these seducing spirits? What are these doctrines of devils? Okay, it lists them here from verse number two. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidden to marry. Forbidden to marry. If you forbid someone to get married, the Bible calls that a doctrine of devils. A doctrine of devils. So if you've got a whole church like the Roman Catholic Church that forbids their leaders, their priests and their cardinals and bishops to not marry, then they're teaching doctrines of devils. Does that surprise anyone that that church is full of doctrines of devils? Not at all, okay? Not at all. Now, it's also forbidden to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God have created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Just to finish that verse. But forbidding someone to marry is a doctrine of devil. And you know Yes, we can laugh at the Roman Catholic Church at what they do and the kind of sins they fall into for, for, for causing people to, to not get married. But you know, this stuff happens even in our kind of churches, even in independent fundamental Baptist churches. You know, you have a young couple wanting to get married and what do the parents say? Oh, you know, don't get married just yet. You know, you, you know, live your life a little bit, you know. Enjoy life before you get married. 
Isn't that what they say? And people say, oh, you know, I want to travel. I want to see Europe before I get married. I want to, I want to experience life before I get married. Because th there's, this, there's this mindset that getting married is this negative thing. There's this mindset that getting married, it, like you, you're losing your life or something like that. You know, and I've often heard people say, you oh, know, the best years of my life were before I got married. The best years of my life was when I was in high school, I was with my mates, I had no responsibilities, you know, I could do what I wanted. But you know, I've not found that to be the best years of my life. I'm just being honest, my, my, my best years of my life are right now. <laughs> the best years of my life is being married and having nine kids with number 10 on the way. That's the best years of my life. In fact, when I realized I'm having the time of my life is like the day before I got married. You know, I had, I had moved into our little granny flat. It was only $100, $150 a week. You know, it was, it was a tiny thing. It wasn't even a granny flat. It was more like a shed. It was super hot during the summer. It was super cold during the night. Uh, but, it, you know, it was my, it was my place. And, and then when we got married, you know, my, Christina came. You know, my wife came to live with me. That was the best time of my life. Man, now I'm really free. Now I don't have, you know, to, to obey my parents. Now I don't have to consider my parents in that sense because now we're a new family and we can do what we like. You know, that, those, those, you know, truly were the best years of my life. But yet my whole life I've been taught, oh, you know, no, it's your single life that's the best years of your life. It, it's, it's high school that's, no. Because you're still doing things that you, you may not want to do. But when you're married and you've got your own family, especially when you're the head of your home, hey, you're free to do what you like as long as it's not a sinful thing, obviously. So, you know, th that is a doctrine of devils. Forbidding people to marry is a doctrine of devils. And I really encourage you, not to put off getting married. If you find a godly spouse and you're able to, you know, especially a man who's able to provide, then I, I, don't, I, I don't know why you'd want to delay it. You know, I don't know why you'd want to delay it. You know, I got married when I was 22. A lot of people say that was young. But had I known a little bit better, had I been a little wise, I would have got married when I was 19. Honestly, that, that's what I would have done. But anyway, you know, so, you know, talking about the Roman Catholic Church, I did say last week that there was 4,444 pedophile priests that were forgiven by, Australian pedophile priests that were forgiven by the, the Pope. Now, I looked that up again later on, and apparently that report wasn't accurate. It was an exaggeration, so I just want to tell you that. Uh, but still, it's not like they're inexcusable, because I looked at the report, and what it really was saying was that there was 1,880 reported incidents of pedophilia in the Roman Catholic Church over the last 60 years in Australia. So it's not like it's, it's not true. I mean, that church is full of pedophiles. That church is full of people teaching doctrines of devil. And of course, if you're going to forbid people to marry, they're going to get into a state of, of especially if they, they can't contain, they're going to get into a state where they, they just lose their minds. And, and look, these, these priests are reprobates. You know, these priests, priests are lost. These, these priests are going to hell. And, you know, they've been given over to a reprobate mind. But that is a doctrine of devils. Let me just reinforce that. Let's look at verse number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 3. It says, He let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. Now, I've often heard verse 3 talking about the physical relationship in a marriage, where if a husband gives due benevolence, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's making sure that his wife's needs are being met physically and, and vice versa. I don't believe that's what verse 3 is saying, though you could apply that to that situation. I believe verse 4 is really is, is talking about that physical relationship. But when it says that the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, see, the word benevolence means kindness and love. Kindness and love. It's not just a physical relationship. Okay? So you ought to love your husband. You ought to love your wife. You ought to serve them and cherish them and make sure they, they, they feel valued and, and and, and loved by you, okay? That's what it means by due benevolence. When you've entered into that marriage, when you've committed, said those vows to one another, you've promised to love each other, okay? Till death do you part, okay? That's your vows, that's your promise. Don't forget what you promised on your wedding day, okay? And at that point, you gave yourself away to serve and love your wife. And the wife gave herself away to love and serve her husband, Okay, so due benevolence isn't just a physical relationship, but it's, it's cherishing and loving, making sure that person feels valued in that marriage relationship. Verse number four, the wife have not power over her own body, but the husband. And likewise, also that husband hath not power over his own body, but the wife. So my physical body is not actually mine. It's actually my wife's. <laughs> and my wife's physical body is not actually hers. It's mine. 
Okay, again, on the, married, on, on the wedding day, that's what you promised. That you would give yourself one to another, you know, you, just you know, uh, to, to one another and to no one else. Okay? So this is the physical relationship. This is where a, a marriage ought to have that physical intimacy in their marriage. Okay? It's an important part of your marriage. Okay? And you know, I, I don't think of it just as the physical relationship. But also, you know, my wife, for example, doesn't like it when I cut my hair. Like if I do a buzz cut, like number one, she doesn't like it. You know, and I, I, I would prefer that because then I don't have to worry about my hair. Like it's just easier to just get number one done and then, you know, next month do it again and kind of thing like that. And my wife doesn't like it. So I'm considerate of that. Hey, my body, the power of my body is my wife. And if she doesn't like that, I'm going to make sure there's a little bit more hair on my head than just a buzz cut, okay? I might do that on the rare occasion, but you know, if I'm going to give you know, my wife due benevolence, if I'm going to you know, commit that you know, my body belongs to my wife, I'm going to try my best to look after myself for the sake of my wife, and my wife is going to do the best she can you know, for me. You know? And that's just the way it is. Verse number five. Defraud ye not one to... Sorry. Yeah. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. That word incontinency, it's kind of like continued. Okay? So what it's saying here is that that physical relationship ought to be something that continues, continues in your marriage. Okay? It's something that, is an, it's something that happens often in the marriage bed. Okay? And then it says, defraud you not one the other. That's fraud. So if you, if you withhold yourself from your spouse... Let's say, you know, you know, your spouse wants to have that you know, intimacy and you turn around and say, well, no, you know, we, we've had an argument, we've had a fight, you know, or you're doing something that I don't like, I'm not going to give myself to you until you sort yourself out. You know, that is you defrauding or committing fraud against your spouse. Okay? That means you're stealing something, you're taking something that belongs from them. Okay? It, it, it's a sin, it's a crime to defraud. And it's the same thing in, in a marriage. If the husband has that physical need for his wife and the, and the wife you know, withholds herself, withdraws herself, that's defrauding your husband and vice versa. Okay? You both have the power over each other's body and you need to give yourselves because if you, do, if, you, if you prevent that intimacy, the Bible says that Satan will tempt you for your incontinency. For, for, for you not being continuing in, in that relationship, Satan will come and tempt you. And this is where the adulteries happen. This is where people start looking at pornography. This is where people start looking for things besides their spouse because that intimacy has stopped. Okay? Now, obviously, some people have more of a drive than others. And, you know, I'm, I'm not going to talk about all of that because that's something, you know, you guys should have, you know, speak between yourselves, husband and wife. But if you are going to withhold one from another, the Bible says there in verse number five that you need consent except it be with consent for a time. So if you are going to withhold that physical relationship from your spouse, you need to make sure there's an agreement with your spouse. Okay? There's consent. Okay? Now people often talk about consent as though you need consent to have that intimacy. But actually the Bible is saying the opposite. To withhold that intimacy, you need to have consent. Now let me give you an example of this. Next, you guys know next month I'll be going to the United States to that soul winning conference. I'm going to be away for a week and a half. So I'm going to be away from my wife for a week and a half. Now, do you think I made that decision to go without first speaking to my wife? Now, you might say, well, you know, you're the man of the house, Kevin. You know, you ought to make the decision there. You know, if you want to go, you just go. Why do you need your wife's approval? Because I'm going to be away from her for a week and a half. Meaning we cannot have that intimate relationship for that week and a half. Do you understand? So I've sought my wife's consent. Honey, I'd like to go to this thing. What do you think? And she goes, yep, sounds great, you know. And also, if you are going to be away from your, physical, from, your, from your spouse, the Bible recommends that it be for prayer and fasting. You know, I've been away on business trips for my wife for a week. I've never, I've never made it more than a week. I've been asking, can you come longer than a week? Can you come for a month? If there's ever been a, a need where it was longer than a week, I just sent another employee if they were willing to go, okay? Because I don't, I don't want to withhold that relationship with my wife. And, you know, I... I, I'm, I you know, I'm a man, I have needs as well for that. So, you know, obviously, think about these things. If you're going to be away from your spouse, don't, you know, just, oh, I'm the man of the house, I'm just going to do what I want. No, 
your, the power of your body, is, your, your wife has power of your body. And if you're going to be away in that sense, then you need to make sure that there's an agreement between husband and wife. And even better, if you give yourselves to prayer and fasting during that time, so Satan cannot tempt you in that sense. Okay? Let's look at verse number 6. Verse number 6. Paul says, But I speak this by permission and not of commandment. So marriage is not a commandment, but it's permissible by God. There's permission to get married, okay? It's not a commandment. Because if it was a commandment, thou shalt get married, then that would mean those that are single and never get married are in sin, right? It's not a commandment. Not everybody needs to get married, but you are permitted. There's permission to get married, okay? It's not, not, it's not that one's wrong and one's right. They're both right, okay? As long as you stay away from fornication. So it's not a sin to get married as long as you're not committing fornication. Look at verse 7. For I would that all men were even as I myself. Now, Paul did not have a wife. He did not have his own family. And he says, I would like it if everybody was like me. I would like it if everybody was single like me. But then he says, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. So what he's saying is, I have a gift of God. I have a gift where I can remain single and not burn in a desire for that physical intimacy. Okay? He's saying that's a gift that God has given me. He goes, one after this manner. So some people, there are some people that have this ability to refrain from having that intimate relationship, from having that desire. And then he says, and another after that. So another one wants to get married and have that intimate intimacy um, in their relationship. Now, turn to, please, again, keep a finger in 1 Corinthians 7 and turn to Matthew 19. Matthew 19, because I just want to show you this, just a teaching from Jesus Christ in this. Just to, uh, because here's the thing. Paul says it, it's a gift. Paul says it's a gift to not desire to get married and have that intimate relationship, okay? So obviously he's keeping himself from, that, from fornication. But as, as a man that doesn't have that gift, that wanted to get married and have children and all that kind of stuff, I find that a bit awkward. I find that a bit weird. Like, is that, I mean, uh, you know, if someone came to me and said, you know, I just have no desire to get married, I'd be like, this guy's a bit crazy. Like, this guy's weird. But no, it's a gift of God, okay? So just look at uh, Matthew 19, please. Matthew 19, verse 11. Jesus says here, But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. In verse 12, For there are some eunuchs. Now, a eunuch is someone that does not have a physical relationship with, with, the, with, with, with their wife, or is not married, okay? That doesn't desire this thing. But there are different types of eunuchs, according to the Bible. And no, they're not homosexuals, in case you're wondering if that's where I'm going. But look at verse number 12. For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb. So there are some men that they were born where they can't have that intimate relationship. Maybe they have a deformity or something like that. Or they just don't have that hormonal drive in them to have that relationship. Okay? Some are born like that from their mother's womb. In fact, I got a phone call from a guy who... I can't remember what he was suffering from. But he's in a wheelchair and he's pretty much suffered this his whole life. And he was talking about how, you know, uh, you know no woman would want to marry him because of the state that he's in. You know, and, and he wouldn't be able to anyway have that physical relationship. So here's an example of someone that was, was born a eunuch from their mother's womb. Okay? So there's a physical issue that he cannot do that task. And then he says, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men. Now this is pretty disgusting. But in the Old Testament days, you're going to read about this in ancient days, where one pe uh, people or one nation would conquer another nation, they would often take some of the men and emasculate them. <laughs> All right, just, uh, and obviously, I mean, that's disgusting, right? But obviously that, that prevents certain hormones from, from being developed in that, inter in that body, and they cannot have that intimate relationship, nor would they probably desire that because of the hormonal change that's taking place in their body. Okay, the reason they do that is kind of the same reason why you take a, a bull and you emasculate the bull uh, and then use it for work on a farm or something like that, because then it's not as aggressive and won't fight back the same thing these people did to men in the Old Testament days, which I'm not saying that's, that's, that, that's really despicable, that's disgusting. But that's what it means by some people have made, been made eunuchs of men. Okay, so they can't. They can't get married, cannot have that intimate relationship. And then it says, 
and there be eunuchs, and this is now an example of Paul. This is an example of Paul. And there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive him, to receive it, let him receive it. So there are some men, like the Apostle Paul, that says, hey, I'm making myself a eunuch. I can overcome this desire to be with a woman because I want to serve fully in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of heaven. I want to be able to serve God with all my ability. I don't want any distractions. I don't want a distraction of a wife, distraction of a family, a distraction of children, so I can give myself wholly to the work of God. Okay? That is the gift because then it says, he, Jesus says, he that is able to receive him, receive it, let him receive it. It's a gift that a man can receive, but it's only to some men. Okay? In, in fact, I would say the majority of men would want to have that intimate relationship, would want to get married, and this would be uh, few and far between. But Paul is an example of this, and this is why Paul was never a pastor. This is why Paul was never a bishop of a church, because he never had a wife. And one of the requirements to be a bishop, one of the qualifications is to have a wife and faithful children, okay? So Paul was never a pastor, okay? Now, if you can go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8. The Bible says, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows. So now we're, 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 we're changing the topic to unmarried, so the singles and widows. So people that were previously married, but the spouse has passed away, okay? It is good for them if they abide even as I. So again, Paul is recommending, hey, if you can abide as me, it is a good thing. Don't feel pressured once again to be forced into marriage if that's something that you don't want in your life, okay? Or especially if you're a widow and, you know, maybe you're an older widow, you don't have to get remarried, okay? And, and again, singles, you don't have to get married, you don't have to feel that pressure, okay? Now, one of the things, and I want to show you this, if you can go to 1 Timothy chapter 5. I'm sorry for taking you to so many different passages, but I feel like we need to compare certain passages here. So please go to 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 11. 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 11. And again, keeping a finger in 1 Corinthians 7 because that is our main text. But 1 Corinthians 5 verse 11. So Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 7 to the widows, it is good if they abide, meaning they don't get remarried, okay, and remain single. It's a good thing. But look at 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 11. 1 Timothy chapter 5, because some people will say, well, this is, a, this is a Bible contradiction. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 11. It says here, But the younger widows refuse, I just want to show you this, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry. So I just want to show you the context is about widows here. Because look at verse number 14. Just, just go down to verse 14. He says, I will therefore that the younger women marry. That includes the young widows, in verse 11. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak re reproachfully. Okay, so hold on, Paul. Are you saying it's good for a widow to remain single? Are you, or are you saying that the, the, you know, widows should get remarried? Which of those two are you saying, Paul? Well, let's get a bit of context. Let's, let's look at verse number 3. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse number 3. Okay? A bit of context here, so we can make sense of these two passages. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 3. Honor widows that are widows indeed. Now what you'll understand, what you'll notice in the Bible, when it says honor, it is often, and I think it might be even every case, I'm not sure, but I won't confirm that just yet, but most often it's talking about a financial support. When it talks about honoring someone, it's saying, hey, make sure you look after them financially. Make sure you look after their needs. So when it says here, honor widows that are widows indeed, it's saying if there are widows in the church, we ought to look after their needs. We ought to look after them financially. But is it just every widow? Is it any widow? No, there's a, there's a criteria as to who those widows are that we ought to look after. Look at verse number four. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. So it's saying if the widow has children or even nephews, it's the children and nephew's responsibility before the church to look after that widow, if that widow has, has a financial need, obviously, okay? It's that, that's the first requirement. If you have a widow in the family, it's your responsibility to look after that widow financially, okay? Because it says honor widows that are widows indeed. Now, verse number five. 
Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate. So if there's a widow in your church that is desolate, doesn't have the children or the nephews to look after, has nobody to look after them financially, and, and trusteth in God. So she's a believer in the church. Okay? She's a believer and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. So she's a, she's a model Christian. She's a good example in the church. She's praying and serving other people in the church. That person, that widow, let's look at verse number 9. We won't read the whole thing. Let's drop down to verse number 9. It says, he, Let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old. That's 60 years old, having been the wife of one man. So there's further requirements. This widow needs to be older than 60 years old and has been the, the wife of one man. So she's not someone that's just been divorced and remarried and divorced and remarried kind of thing, right? She's a good example, a, a model Christian. She's been married. She's had children. She serves in the church. She's a believer. Look at verse number 10. Well reported of, of for good works. So she does good works. You know, she's got a good reputation. If she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, so she's someone that's very hospitable, that looks after the needs of strangers. If she have washed the saints' feet, so she served in the church. If she has relieved the afflicted, she's looked after those that are suffering. If she have diligently, diligently followed every good work. Okay? Now, that's what verse number three is talking about. Honor widows that are widows indeed. So the widows that we ought to look after in a church is a widow that has a good reputation, that has been married to one man, that, has, that is over 60 years old and is desolate, doesn't have anybody else to look after her then it becomes the responsibility of the church to look after that widow. Okay, does that make sense? There's, there's, there's a whole list of re, uh, requirements there. Now, uh, verse 11, back to verse 11. But the younger widows, so the, who are the younger widows? Those that are under 60 years old, okay? Which means if you're under 60, ladies, then you're considered younger. You're considered young in the Bible, okay? But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry. Okay, so a, it's saying that a widow that's under 60, that has that financial need, that has the need of a man, she will get married. She will find someone to get married. And if you're preventing her from getting married, she might wax wanton against Christ, meaning that she might put Christ's name to shame. She might commit like fornication or things like that. Verse number 12, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. So they'll lose their reputation. Okay, if it's a younger widow. Because here's the thing, a woman does require a man naturally, and a man requires a woman. So if they're under 60 years old, you know, and you know, we're talking about things like menopause, because you know, a woman that goes through, and I'm sorry for these topics, but you kind of have to talk about it, right, to cover it. But a woman that goes through, most women go through menopause when they're about 50 years old, okay, in the early 50s. And after menopause, your desire for that intimacy drops significantly, because there's a change in your, in your body, okay? Now, obviously, so when you're 60 years and over, you probably are not going to, you know, desire that so much, okay? And it's, it's better for that woman to just remain unmarried and just continue serving in the church, and if they've got no one else to look after them, then, um, you know, the church ought to look after that, that widow. But if they're younger than 60 years old, it's likely they're going to, be, to, to want the desire of a man, and instead of, you know, destroying their reputation, just let them get married, okay? So... Look at verse, uh, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. I just want to tie this up all together now. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. So we're talking about widows, okay? Widows that are under 60 years old, that have a financial need and physical, um, physical, a physical need as well in the marriage. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. But if they cannot contain, so if that widow cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. Okay, that's burning lust, burning desire, and then end up committing fornication or doing something wicked. Okay, so again, it's good if a widow is able to financially provide for herself, if she doesn't have a need for a husband, then she can remain single. That's a good thing. But if she has a need for a husband and, and needs financial assistance and aid, then she ought to get married. Okay, if I haven't explained that well, then ask me after the service, otherwise I'll be on this topic uh, all day. But let's look at verse number 10. Verse number 10, we, we now move on to divorce. We move on to, and, and I'm not, look, I'm not going to cover everything. At some point, I need to preach a whole sermon on divorce. 
Just, just divorce in of itself needs a whole sermon. And I guess the reason I haven't really preached a whole sermon on it is because I don't think anyone's close to getting divorced at this point in time. But if it is, if someone thinks like, you know, I could go, you know, my marriage, you know, is that bad, I could go, then I would expedite that sermon and, and preach on divorce. But we're going to cover a few things on divorce right now. Verse number 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. So there's a commandment of the Lord to the married, right? I know Paul is writing this, but he says, look, I'm not giving this command. The Lord gives this command, Okay. Let not the wife depart from her husband. Does God want divorce? No way. This is the command. Let not the wife depart from her husband. Verse 11. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried. Let her remain unmarried. So if a husband and wife get divorced, what is the commandment, the clear commandment of God? Should that person get remarried? No. Okay? Or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife. So the wife, a married couple, a wife should not leave her husband and a husband should not put away the wife. Okay? But what's the commandment of the Lord should they get divorced? The commandment was two options. Remain unmarried, don't get remarried, or reconcile with your spouse. Okay? Or reconcile with your spouse. Now, please go to Matthew chapter 19. I think we were already there before, weren't we? Uh, yeah, we were there before, sorry. Matthew 19. Matthew 19. Keep a finger in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and go to Matthew 19. Because Jesus speaks about divorce and it is completely consistent with what we see with Paul. Okay? Matthew chapter 19, verse 3. This is, this is before the, the talk about the eunuchs. Uh, but... Chapter number three, the Pharisees also came unto him. So the Pharisees came unto Jesus, tempting him, and saying unto him, it is, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? So is it okay, for whatever reason, for a man to put away his wife, to divorce his wife? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said for this cause... Shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh? Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God have joined together, let not man put asunder. So a marriage, when you've entered into the marriage union, the Bible says God has put you together. Okay? Let no man put asunder. Not just any man outside of that relationship, but that includes the men and the women inside that relationship, okay? God's plan is for you to remain married till death do you part, okay? Divorce should not ever be an option, okay? In God's perfect will. Verse number seven. And they said unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? Now, just let me, just, let me say this. Even today... When it comes to the topic of divorce, you're going to find different churches teach different things. Okay? And different you know, churches teach different things on divorce or when is, when is it grounds for divorce, when is it grounds for marriage. I've been to a number of churches in my life and I've, I don't think I've ever seen a consistent view on this. Okay? And quite often, and look, even in these days, even in the days of Jesus Christ, people had different views on divorce. It just seems to be something. And, and here's the thing about it. Is marriage complicated? One man, one wife, they love each other, they want to commit themselves for the rest of their life and not have anyone else, you know, uh, for richer or for poorer, for s in sickness or in health. What else is the other one? To death of your partner. Up in, in, in good, in something about goodness. Good. Anyway, I don't know what it was. It's not a complicated topic. It's not a complicated doctrine. One man, one woman for life. Very simple. But you know divorce is so complicated. <laughs> like as soon as you do something that the Lord does not want you to do, something that was supposed to be very simple and straightforward, it gets so complicated. Okay? Is this grounds for divorce? Can I get remarried? What do we do with the kids? Those kind of questions. And if someone gets remarried, what happens now? Is that person allowed in the church or are they not allowed in the church? 
Are they continually being adulterous? All kinds of questions, all kinds of complications come up. Which is why so many churches and preachers have so many different ways of viewing this, so many different interpretations. But I'm the kind of guy that just likes to keep it simple. Always. You know, if I'm going to be strong on a topic, strong on a doctrine, it's because the simple scriptures, uh, you know, state that. You know, as far as the teaching, you know what I, what I talked about on Thursday? If you're going to debate a doctrine, make sure that you've got clear text. Text that you're not just interpreting or explaining to someone, but text that clearly teach that truth. And I think it's important for us as believers to keep things simple. What is clear in the scriptures? We saw the commands, the plain commands of God in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. If you get divorced, two options. Don't get remarried or get reconciled. Okay? The two options. Now, are people going to get remarried? Yes. Okay? We'll talk about that soon. But why did Moses give the commandment of divorcement? Verse number 8. He said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you or allowed you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. So it's because of your hardness. It's because you guys are stiff-necked. Because you guys are stupid and you can't keep the things simple. One man, one woman for life. That's why Moses had given you the command to put, uh, to put away your wives. Verse number 9, And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. Okay, so there is one exception to divorce. And that exception, according to Jesus Christ, says, except it be for fornication. And, you know, this is a topic. This is where people start having different ideas because it's like, well, what does fornication mean? Now, just for the record, I'll be quick, and I'm not going to teach on this because it needs a whole sermon, like I said. I do believe that fornication can be a general umbrella term for all kinds of sexual sins. I do believe that. But when it comes to this topic of divorce... I believe fornication, and I, I think I can even prove you that from verse number 9 here, that it is not adultery. It is different to adultery, and that it is prior to the consummation of your marriage, prior to you becoming one, fest, one flesh in the physical sense between husband and wife. Let me just give you a quick example of this, because we don't really, it's hard for Australians to wrap their head around this, because in Australia we get married, and on, on the wedding night we probably consummate the marriage straight away kind of thing. But in, in South America, for example, in other places of Europe as well, you can't just get married like in a church and then be, and that your husband and wife. Like in Chile, for example, there is a civil, uh, legal marriage that takes place first, where that, where that, where that husband or, or that, or that uh, bride and the bridegroom go and get their marriage like uh, authorized by the government. Okay, this is a, this is a legal uh, uh, document that says you are now legally married. Okay. Now, their ceremonial marriage, their marriage in the church, could take place many weeks after or many months after, because obviously it takes time to organize you know, a, a wedding. Okay? It takes a long time. But what happens is, especially with believers, especially with Christians, they'll, get, they'll then get married, let's say a few months later, once their, their, their marriage is ready. And then after that church, after the marriage in the church, because they say, well, that's before God and before witnesses and all that kind of stuff, then they'll consummate that marriage. But there was a period where legally that man and that woman were married. That was the husband and the wife. And I think that's the practice that we see here like between Joseph and Mary when Joseph wanted to put away his wife. Okay? And in that sense, yeah, there could be many weeks and many months and yet yeah, it's, it's possible for that spouse to cheat on the other person, commit fornication. And in that case, if it's found out that one of them has committed fornication, then you can put away that spouse. You can divorce that spouse and get remarried. Okay? Now, I'm not going to go into all that because so many verses to teach from, but I just want to, just for the record, you guys know where I stand on that topic. Okay? Um, now, the question that comes up is this. So, if, 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 if getting divorced and getting remarried is considered adultery, the question that comes up is, is the person who got divorced and remarried living in perpetual, perpetual adultery? Are they just continuously an adulteress or an adulterer, you know, is, is that, because here's the thing, you know, we should not allow people in this church that, we've already gone through some of these things that, you know, are, you know um, have committed fornication, and in that sense, yeah, I would lump adultery into that, you know, into that sort of umbrella term of fornication. 
And then some people say, well, you know, there's a, there's a couple in your church that has been divorced and remarried, and they're in perpetual adultery. So why are you allowing that person into the church? That's a question that comes up. Okay. Now, please turn to Romans chapter 7. Because I, I want to show you where this teaching comes from. Romans chapter 7, verse 2. Now, I, I don't agree with that. I'll just straight out. I don't agree with that. But I want to show you where the teaching comes from. Okay? So you know, if it ever comes up, you guys have an idea of, of what this is. Romans chapter 7, verse 2. Romans chapter 7, verse 2. And it looks like I am going to have to save some of this for Thursday. Uh, anyway, Romans chapter 7, verse 2. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. So a woman is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. Yeah? But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So if her husband is dead, she's no longer married. There's no longer that legal requirement for her to remain with her husband. Okay? Verse number three. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, so she gets divorced and marries another man and her husband is still alive, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she's free from that law that she, ha that she is no adulteress though she be married to another man. Okay, so you can kind of see here how people can take this verse and say, well, if your, your first husband is still alive and you're, you get remarried, then you're kind of like, you'll be caught an adulteress, meaning that like, your whole life, until that husband dies, you're an adulteress. I mean, that, that's just, first of all, think about how silly that is. Okay? Someone that's been remarried, okay, you're an adulteress. Yes, that, that second marriage was adultery. Okay? But then you're going to continue calling that person an adulteress every day of their life. You're an adulteress, you're an adulteress, you're an adulteress, you're an adulteress, you're an adulteress. But then the first husband dies, oh, now you're good. Now you're good to go because your husband died. You see how silly that is? Turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4 because I want to show you a couple of things here. John chapter 4 verse 16. I think this is important. John chapter 4 verse 16. Because what is adultery? What is adultery? Now, actually, while you're turning there, let me just quickly explain to you what Romans 7 is talking about. I believe what it's talking about is if your husband, your first husband is still alive and you marry another man, a second husband, while he's still alive, that initial marriage was adultery. But I don't believe you're then in continual adultery. Okay? And I'll show you why I don't believe that. And I actually believe Romans 7, if, if read clearly, will reinforce that. But I just want to show you from the words of Jesus Christ. John chapter 4, verse 16. This is the story of the Samaritan woman. Remember, Jesus came to the world and spoke to the Samaritan woman. Okay? And then he explains about, you know, if you ask, you know, the waters of it, of you know uh, everlasting life you know you would have asked of me and that kind of thing but verse number 16 jesus saith unto her go call thy husband and come hither so call your husband and come and come to me the woman answered and said i have no husband jesus said unto her thou hast well said i have no husband so this woman is not currently married okay she has no husband jesus confirms that she has no husband Verse 18, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, in that saidest thou truly. Now this woman, Jesus knows that she's had five husbands in her past, and the man she's living with, number six, is not her husband. She's not married him. Okay, do you get that? Now, you could say, yeah, like, maybe she, the first five husbands, you know, died, and she, you know, she legitimately just got remarried. You know, each one of them just died. I mean, what, what bad luck you know, that would be, right? First of all. But I think the fact that number six, she's living in, in fornication with him, she's not even married to the man, proves that this woman's not the best of character. Okay, I think this, woman, this proves that this woman, you know, committed adultery in her marriage, got divorced with another man, got married, you know, committed adultery, got divorced, and so on and so forth, to the point where, you know, she's, she's now just living with a man. I think that it shows her character. Okay, but what is adultery? Is adultery... So if you're husband and wife and you're having that physical relationship, is that adultery? Of course not. Adultery is when it's outside of the bounds of marriage, right? Outside of the bounds of marriage. So, if... How can I put this? So those that say someone's in perpetual adultery... 
But Jesus says, those were her husbands. You understand what I'm saying? Those five were her husbands. Let's take the first one. She committed fornication, whatever. She, 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 she divorced her first husband, married the second. Jesus calls that her husband. The third, he calls her husband. The fourth, she calls the husband. Okay? All five husbands, he calls them her husband. So if that's her husband and she's having that marriage and that physical intimacy, is she in adultery? Think about it. Is she in adultery? No. Otherwise, it would not be her husband. Otherwise, she would not be his wife because adultery is outside of the bounds of marriage. And Jesus is confirming that was your husband. Does that make sense? So it's that initial marriage when your husband was alive or your wife was alive that was adulterous. But once you've made those new vows, that is your husband. That is your wife. Okay? And so if you have a wife and a husband and you're having that intimate relationship, that is not adultery because it is your wife, it is your husband. And it, w- it would be called something else than adultery because adultery is outside of the marriage. Okay? Something outside of that marriage. So let me just say this. If you've been divorced and remarried, that's not ideal. Okay? But you have made those vows to the second person. Make sure this marriage works. Make sure this marriage lasts till death do you part and serve the Lord in this existing marriage. You know, people have made mistakes. You know, I've made mistakes in my, in my life. People, all people have made kinds of mistakes, right? They come and now look, present day, all right, this, I've made these mistakes in my life. I now need to make sure that I don't make these same mistakes again and that I teach my children not to make the same mistakes that I've made. Okay? And you say, Kevin, why do you preach this sermon? Well, because I want our kids not to make those mistakes. I want our kids to make sure when they get married that they make sure they choose someone that they will be able to commit their whole life to. Someone that they say, hey, I'm, my body now belongs to that person. Is that, is that, that's the person you ought to marry. Someone that you know that you can trust. And look, I don't understand, I don't understand divorce. I, honestly, I do not understand divorce. Because I'm happily married. I'm not boasting, I'm, I'm just being honest. I'm, I'm happily married. There was a time when I was 22 that I wanted to exchange those vows with my wife. You know, I knew what I was getting into. It's not like I'm stupid. I mean, I know this is for life. And I'm not even entertaining the thoughts of marriage. I told you, it was the time of my life. It was the best years of my life. It's still the best years of my life. So I can't even think about where I'd get to a point where I'd want to divorce my wife because I'm having a blast. <laughs> I'm having a blast. So I don't really understand why people would want to get divorced, especially if you made the right decision the first time. Okay, that, that's what it takes. Make the right decision the first time. Make sure it's a godly spouse, someone who loves the Lord, someone that you're willing to serve for the rest of your life. Okay, now I'm not saying it's always going to be perfect. And in fact, if you read this chapter, you'll find that marriage isn't perfect. And that's why Paul's encouraging the singles, hey, it's, it's good to stay single. But, uh, you know, if I can give you an, another example, let me give you an example, another example. I was in a church where there was an example where, where a woman divorced her husband and she'd been divorced for many, many, many years, okay? Um, And then she met a man in the church that was single and and was never married. They, they, they got, they were, they became friends and then they wanted to get married. And there was a lot of opinions in the church. It's like, well, what's going on here? You know, that's, that's, and look, I I believe them getting married was adultery. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not excusing it, okay? But they ended up getting married, they ended up getting married, and then they, they came back. They, di- they didn't come to church straight away because they knew the controversy in the church. But eventually they c- did come back to the church. And look, if that happens, that's your brother and sister in the Lord. Yes, they've committed adultery. Yes, she shall be called an adulteress in that sense of what took place. But now, look, they're, they're accepted in the church. Okay? But here's the thing. They stayed in the church for a while, but there's a lot of talk. You know, why is the pastor allowed this and why is that and blah, blah. And I can imagine how hard it would have been for them (laughs) to sort of hear these things and hear the things that, you know, people were saying and the rumors that were going around. They eventually ended up leaving the church. They ended up leaving Sydney and going somewhere else to another church because they couldn't take the, the things that were being spoken about. Now, let me just say two things. We should not be that way, okay? If that happens, yes, they did wrong. But they've, they've made these vows. This is now a husband and wife and just respect the fact that they're husband and wife. But at the same time, the person that's done that, 
you know, that has been divorced and remarried, commit that fornication in that sense, don't expect everybody to celebrate your marriage. Don't expect everyone to just celebrate the wedding because it was adultery. You understand what I'm saying? And so don't get discouraged if that's the case because people, you know, have their convictions and, and read what read in the Bible and they go, I, I can't, you know, God says this isn't right, so I can't just, wow, congratulations on, on, your, on your marriage, you know, on your, on your wedding. No, but at the same time, hey, you've done this now, you, you, you've, you've exchanged those vows, this is a new, uh, you know, all right, you know, that's between you and the Lord, you know, I'm not going to go around spreading rumors and make you uncomfortable at the same time. Do you understand? I'm reminded of a time at, in my workplace where um, there was a man who was in his 40s and whenever there was some occasion, people would come around and collect money. You know, oh, do you mind you know, putting five bucks, ten bucks into this to buy a gift for this and that? And someone came around saying, oh, you know, this man who's in his 40s is going to get married. You know, would you like? And I was like, yeah, you know, because I love marriage. You know, even if they're unbelievers, I do believe marriage is honorable. So I was willing to pull out, you know, I was going to pull out some money and I'm like, oh man, so good that he's finally getting married kind of thing. And they're like, oh no, but this is his second marriage. <laughs> so I was like, no, nah, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not putting into that. You know, I'm not going to celebrate the fact that he was divorced and, and got remarried. You know, you know what I'm saying? Now, I mean, I, I hope second marriage lasts, you know, don't get me wrong, but I, I'm not going to celebrate it. I'm not going to be, oh, great work, you know, because you're doing wrong. Another time, so, you know, someone came around collecting money and, you know, uh, there, was, there was a man in, in, the, in the workplace that was married and had children. They were collecting money and said, oh, you know, this man, he's, he's going to have a baby. And I'm like, awesome. You know, I'm all for marriage. I'm all for having babies. <laughs> you know, so yeah, I'll, I'll put in. And then I find out as, I, as I'm putting in, oh yeah, but it's not his wife's child. It's some, some girl in the workplace that got pregnant. I'm, like, I'm not putting in. <laughs> I'm not going to celebrate the fact that he's committed adultery and that she's a, you know, that she's, she's a whore and that, you know, I'm not going to celebrate that. You know, so don't expect Christians that uphold the Bible as the Word of God, as the final authority, to celebrate sin. You know, don't expect that. But at the same time, if people have made mistakes, you know, and they're trying to do things right, you know, don't go around and destroy their life either. You know, you don't have to celebrate. I'm not asking you to celebrate it, but just don't go around trying to destroy people's lives for the mistakes they've made. It's life. It's, you know, we're sinners. We're all sinners. We've all done stupid things in our life. Um... So you know what? I think I'm going to leave it there. I've got so much more I want to talk about. I think it's a probably a good place. I'm only up to verse 12. Far out. Anyway, <laughs> I think I'll leave it there. I hope you've learned some things just, just in that. Um, I'll definitely talk about these things. Uh, cont I'll continue talking about these things on Thursday. Uh, so let's pray.